on a tired night when I was in high school. I texted my boyfriend at the time in the hopes of making me feel better. I was having a panic attack related to the abuse I had suffered at the hands of my rapist. And so, laying on the couch and texting him through shaken breaths, I relayed to him how I could still feel his tongue lingering on my back, my face pushed into the pillow when I tried to make a sound. And when my boyfriend responded, he told me he didn't want to hear about my old sex life. Obviously, I can't blame him. He was young and uninformed, but that conversation has really stuck in my mind since then. Our culture doesn't understand sexual abuse. We hide behind allegories and euphemisms. We cover it up and are afraid to tell our stories. And the media we consume can help or hurt discussions. But there's no doubt it's an impetus for many of our long-standing cultural beliefs, individually and collectively. I want to look at a lot today surrounding this fundamental misunderstanding we have around sexual abuse and the normalization of sexualizing children for profit in popular media. I think it's important to start this video with a whole lot of disclaimers and a little bit of personal background. I always add a trigger warning at the beginning of my videos, but in this case, seriously, if you're not able to handle intense topics and detailed discussions around sexual violence, click off this video now. Go take care of yourself. If you want something equally as fucked up that doesn't talk explicitly about sexual abuse, check out the video this initially split off from. Why are we obsessed with children saving the world? So I myself am a survivor of sexual abuse in a couple of different situations. And ever since then, I've used media about sexual violence, whether fiction or nonfiction, to help me cope, help me understand, and better inform me so I can speak out against it and help others who have been abused. And I'll admit, as time has gone by, I've gained a morbid fascination with the underworkings of sexual violence, as well as a passionate call to action against it. What does it do to a survivor, to a perpetrator? How does sex become power and not pleasure? How do systemic cycles of abuse in Hollywood, in the church, even the government, become weapons of psychological warfare? And how does leaving abuse unspoken allow it to continue unseen? Through this long-standing quest to understand how anyone could commit such an act as rape, you begin to see how deep-seated this all is, especially when it comes to the abuse of children and the fetishization of innocence and purity, the normalization of wanting sexual partners to be totally shaved, the stark contrast of schoolboy versus schoolgirl searches on Google, how pigtails get you more tips, how girls' clothes are literally smaller than boys despite the groups being the same size, celebrity countdowns to 18, it's everywhere. I excitedly opened my first fan mail to read a rape fantasy that a man had written me. A countdown was started on my local radio show to my 18th birthday, euphemistically the date that I would be legal to sleep with. Movie reviewers talked about my budding breasts in reviews. I understood very quickly, even as a 13-year-old, that if I were to express myself sexually, I would feel unsafe and that men would feel entitled to discuss and objectify my body. And similarly to any other subtextual understanding of a work, themes of sexual abuse and psychosexual analysis rear their fucked up little heads in way more places than you'd expect. I'm going to take a page out of Jules Dapper's book and use her method of analyzing the subtextual themes of childhood sexual abuse and child's play by rephrasing the plot of Monica Magica as a story about grooming and the aftermath of sexual abuse. Then we'll look at a work that's much more overt about their sexual themes, Evangelion, and ask if its criticism and understandings of psychosexuality are made null by its ever more gratuitous sexualizing of its young female characters. Before I go any further, there's something to be said here about the Eastern acceptance of non-sexual nudity that's still shocking to the U.S. And because I'm a white guy that grew up in the U.S. and will never be allowed into an onsen for a couple of reasons, I might look at nude portrayals of these characters differently than intended. Still, when you take a look at the context surrounding a lot of this seemingly non-sexual nudity, it's hard not to feel like there's something more going on. Madoka Magica is girlhood decomposing personified. Visually, it can remind me of a recent trend in online art, trauma core and kid core, where symbols and aesthetics of childish, innocent, pink and flowery imagery are juxtaposed with intrusive thoughts, violence, and filth. 
I want to recognize the space most of the show lives in as this subversion of a flowery understanding of girlhood, as an apt visualization of experiencing childhood trauma. How can one reconcile with these two completely different concepts at once? Being young, being abused, being a person and a sex object, etc. So let's take a look at the rest of the show to try to unravel how this symbolism can rewrite our understanding of the show. Try to let the magic of the show leave you for a moment. Remove Kyube's supernatural appearance and just listen. You have this 13-year-old girl, pretty shy and unbecoming, unsure of her place in the world, who wants to make a difference but doesn't know how. Remember when you told me I could become a really powerful magical girl if I wanted? Was that for real? Really powerful doesn't even begin to describe it. Your powers would be almost limitless. You'd be the strongest magical girl in this world. After having a seemingly chance encounter where she was able to save a wounded person, they ask a favor of them to make a contract. Another girl around the first girl's age has already made a contract with this person, and she seems beautiful, successful, mature, and amazing to the first girl. Both this new girl and the person promise the girl anything she wants in return for making the contract. It is a contract after all, so you might as well try to get something out of the deal. You could wish to be a billionaire, or you could wish for the perfect boyfriend. Yeah, I know, but... Okay, how about this? If you can't decide on something to wish for by the time I finish off this witch, we'll have a feast, and you can ask Kyube for a fabulous cake. Huh? Seriously? Yes, you could ask for the biggest and most extravagant cake ever. <sighs> then we can throw a party for everyone. A celebration to announce the two of us becoming a magical girl duo. But I... I can't do something like that for a cake. Then decide on something you want. For a cake? And the person pulls the girl aside constantly to tell her she's special and she has more potential than the others. As far as I'm huh? concerned, the sooner you decide, the better. Oh, please. If you became a magical girl, there's no doubt you'd be much more powerful than Mommy. Huh? You've thought this through as well, haven't you, Madoka? I know how much you want to protect Sayaka. I think it's good you're coming along with us. That way, if we find ourselves in a bad spot, You'll be our trump card. A friend of the girls is involved too, and they start acting differently together in school, around friends and around their parents. Excuse me, what's going on between you? Why do you keep staring at each other? Huh? Oh, uh, it's just... They have a mutual secret now, seemingly able to understand each other more deeply, but also sadder, more tired and more irritable. When the friend inevitably makes the contract first, she quickly devolves into a shell of the person she was, especially after learning the truth of the contract. Once you get used to it, you figure out how to block out all the pain. <laughs> it's true! I can't block out the pain! <laughs> I don't feel any pain anymore! Hey, is this world even worth protecting? What have I been fighting for all this time? Answer me. Right now. Come on, tell me. Or else. The good thing is, I did save a few people. But the bad thing is, I got angrier and my heart filled up with envy and hate. It got so bad, I even hurt my best friend. Sayaka, your soul gem! For all the happiness you wish for someone, someone else gets cursed with equal misery. That's how it works for magical girls. And that's how it is for me. I was stupid. So stupid. The truth is, the person trapped their souls and left their bodies empty, used them up for their energy, specifically because of their age and gender. The most effective energy came from females in their second stage of development, when they have the most intense fluctuations of hope and despair. At the precise moment when your soul gems flare out and become grief seeds, an enormous amount of energy is created. As an incubator, my job is to gather up that expended energy. And leaves them to become the villain once he's through with them. That's all we are to you? Disposable? You want us to die for you, 
and you don't even care. So much of this feels exactly what it's like to be sexually abused at a young age. The grooming, oh, you're so special. Mommy literally being the bait and like literally offering cake and candy. Hey, little girl, you want some candy? Wow, mommy, this is so delicious. Mm, super delicious. Thank you. Since Kyube chose the two of you, that means you're both involved in this, like it or not. How Kyube pits the girls against each other. Sorry, but this territory has been taken over by another magical girl. She made a contract with me a little while ago. What the hell? That's so odd. Most girls accept my offer right away. If you want to stop them and you don't mind using force, there is a way. <laughs> Only another magical girl could come between them now. And you're more than qualified to become one, if you really want to. You know, that familiar we saw last night was pretty small, but it could still kill someone. Maybe it'll come after your dad next, or your mom. What would you do if it came after Tatsuya, huh? Would you be okay with that? Could you forgive anyone who let them die? I didn't want this power so I could fight witches. I wanted it so I'd have the strength to do what's right and protect the ones I love. You get it? If there are people out there who are worse than witches, then I'm gonna fight them. Especially if they're magical girls. <laughs> How he manipulates them. I bet you're upset with me too, aren't you? How some get out and try to warn the others, but it doesn't work. Because if that's the truth, then you wouldn't try changing the life you have or the person you are. Otherwise, you'd lose everything you love. I warned you. Remember? Yes. Very well then. I hope my warning's not in vain. The dissociation of soul and body. Your bodies are such fragile containers. Just a cluster of neurons, organs, and a circulatory system. It's an amazing construction. But once your body stops functioning, your soul disappears. Did you honestly think I'd let you girls fight witches using those fragile human bodies of yours? That's impossible. For magical girls, the so-called bodies you used to be housed in are nothing more than exterior hardware now. Your souls are your real bodies. Making that happen is part of my job when I recruit magical girls. I take a person's soul from their body and turn it into a soul gem. You bastard. What have you done? You scumbag! You turned us into zombies! Is that what happened? But isn't it more convenient? If your heart explodes or you bleed out every last drop of blood, no matter what happens, you just heal your bodies with magic and get up again. Isn't it better to have that in a fight than be trapped in a body prone to failure? That's horrible. That's horrible! Feeling like your body's empty, like you're already dead. Well, maybe I behave this way because I'm not human anymore. How could I ever face Kyosuke again? now that I'd been turned into this thing. Uh, the cycle of abuse creates more abusers. The scene that fully solidified this for me was close to Sayaka's demise. She's breaking down to Madoka about how she'll never be with Kiyosuke. And there's nothing I can do about it now! Because I'm... I'm already dead! I'm a zombie! I can't ask him to hold me if I'm like this! I can't ever ask him to kiss me! <laughs> literally gives me chills there are a lot of thankless heroes when it comes to the prevention of further abuse by previous victims and i think homura is a great depiction of that as someone who's been on either side of this dilemma i remember a ton of my older friends warning me about getting close to my abuser one of whom had had an encounter with him you could consider sexual harassment and i didn't listen I was young and vulnerable, and he roped me right into his trap, showing me his real self once we started having sex. First, consensually, but less and less as time went on. And now I feel like Homoda, sometimes losing friendships to the amount of times I try to warn them about getting into situations like mine. Like Homoda, I too have been vilified for speaking out against my abuser, and he's tried to paint me as the evil one to people who don't know the whole story. It might be hard to believe, but as a survivor of abuse, I sometimes find myself disheartened by implications of sexual abuse without the outright witnessing of them, as seeing that heinous act puts you into the reality of a victim in a way no do-si-doing or euphemism can. 
So in a way, this realization about Madoka Magica felt unique. Similarly to how headcanons can sometimes feel like more accurate representation than actual representation. If you're interested in that, don't worry, I have a video in the works. And this becomes a larger allegorical example of that to me. To have your innocence ripped from you, girlhood decomposing around you, the feeling that your body isn't whole, isn't human, or alive anymore. All this empathy was rushed back into my inner child when I was watching the show, and I felt like Madoka's cleansing of the witches was for me too, an absolution of my trauma and so many others like us. But Madoka Magica shows an even darker side of sexual abuse. The tactics Kyube uses on a global level mirror that of ritual abuse and systemic grooming, the likes of which come from cults, from sex trafficking organizations, and more. The large-scale effort made by Kyube is so eerily similar to so many tactics used by these types of predators to groom and brainwash their young victims into the perfect targets. When you look at sources on the signs of grooming, they all fall into a pretty succinct timeline. Targeting, gaining trust and information, filling a need, isolation, and maintaining control. Some specific signs include getting new things and expensive gifts, noticeable changes in behavior and attitude, new groups of friends the victim keeps accidentally running into, and disconnecting with their hobbies and the people they love. All ringing a bell, right? And if we go as far to say that making a contract is selling your body, Kyobe's not only a groomer, but a fucking pimp. There's still an elephant in the room, though. And that's how they're kind of making the little girl sexy. And worse, a ton of fans are into them. In the show itself, there's a couple of instances of the girls being naked or posed in provocative positions. But it's the fan base that's created dojinchis, body pillows, and other gross fuck shit of these kids. And who else is like that, but much more explicit about this in the text? Evangelion. So here we have two works that play with some really fascinating, dark, and important undertones, but are they heightened or lessened by their overt sexualization of their young female characters? And to posit another question or theory I want you to keep in the back of your mind as we continue, is this a product of having to add fan service into these crazy shows? Some sort of conscious or subconscious agreement to do this in order to be as weird and as experimental as they came out to be? What does that mean? And can those elements mingle in such touchy subject matter as this? It's obvious the hatred Ano has for otaku culture, and the deeper understanding of an otaku as someone who runs away from their problems and uses sexual fantasies, merchandise, and escapism to fill the void of lack of any meaningful relationships. He seems to think otaku culture is ruining anime, has been for a while, and probably always will. So then why, as the franchise continued, is there literally enough merchandise to live off of? And specifically, so much merchandise of the young female characters in compromising sexualized positions. The show assumes a position of Freudian psychosexuality from the get-go, and it's one of the most important elements of the show as a whole. But I find so many critiques of the otaku and characters in-universe fall short the more it's played up. I've coined this concept as metasexualization, trying and failing to use sexualization as a critique of the idea of sexualizing. The perfect example in the show for me is Shinji's visit to Rei's apartment in episode 5. Shinji seeing Rei naked is the culminating metaphor of episode 5, seeing Rei's life laid bare for Shinji for the first time after the stuff at school and with Gendo, and her eraserhead ass apartment with the raw visuals of blood, rags, and medication spewed everywhere. Gendo's broken glasses, his broken fatherhood, given to the surrogate daughter, and broken because he cares more about her than his son. And of course, the Freudian nightmare that is Shinji seeing his pseudo-mother naked in his father's glasses. But then it gets exploitative, with the bras and underwear, the submissive shot of her under him, and the boob grab. It's just too much. Like so many things throughout the series, it's a really poignant metaphor, tarnished with gratuitous 14-year-old sexuality. The rebuilds take any meaningful symbol from the original show and steep it in butt shots and bullshit. End of Evangelion showed us how much more explicit films in the franchise could get and explicit fan service became a staple of the rebuilds. In the middle of the second rebuild, Asuka has to wear this incredibly revealing and frankly ugly test suit. 
Even Asuka herself comments on it. One last thing. It's cool that it's red and all, but what pervert designed this suit? <sighs> it's a bit revealing. What was the point of this in universe or in real life? Except just to be fan service with a dumb quip and something sci-fi to slightly justify its being. What does it say about Asuka? About Nerve? About the viewers? That we're horny? It's the rebuild's representation of women summed up into a single costume change. And when looking at the amount of figures and fan art made of Asuka in the test suit, it's also the definitive example that these films are here for no other sake than to profit off the audience they initially criticized. Although a rating website for parents says the nudity is okay and funny, when they're naked at the bathhouse it's an erection joke, Misato is a perv jokingly about Shinji to himself and Ritsuko and then literally, again, like everything else because she doesn't know how to love without sex, but still, the never-ending ass shots of the rebuilds, constant gags, and serious moments of children being naked in front of adults. Oh, and Toji straight up sexually harassing Asuka in multiple ways immediately after meeting her as a fucking slapstick gag too. It goes on and on and on. And what does it do for the show and its characters? Continually proving to us they're teenage pigs? Piling on trauma for the female characters? Or, sickest of all, is it actually there for the fanbase? There's a ton of different parts to the Ava fanbase. Of course there are, it's one of the most popular and influential anime of all time. Old and young, men and women, gay and ugly, everyone. And a lot of us are smart enough to keep our heads on our shoulders and not lust after kids. But the problem is so prevalent, there are always running jokes about how Ava fans are pedos, how Asuka isn't attractive in the rebuilds because she's not a minor, etc. But after a while, these jokes became so prevalent, they're almost metasexualizing. How many memes with lewd photos can you have until it's not a joke anymore? And even if it is, maybe it's just not funny after all this time. So is it all about money? I don't know. I don't want it to be, and I don't think it is. What I've really seen the more I've looked into these works and their fan bases is that the art itself isn't, and most of the fans aren't, but the money-making middlemen are peddling oodles of bullshit to a small but very vocal minority of creeps. But these extremists continue to normalize behaviors that snowball into the perfect storm of a culture of sexual taboos and abuse. I'm hopeful in the thought that we're not prone to this, but rather it's been shoved down our throats for so long we thought we made it up. Which means if we stay mindful and vocal about our views, we could change the ways this has seeped into our media, if not our cultures themselves. I bring up my experiences to give an individual, experiential look on the ways works themselves and the cultures around them can relate to and affect real survivors of sexual abuse. I feel seen in the subtext of Madoka Magica, but sometimes I can feel dirty participating in Evangelion fan culture online. I see a lot of other people talking about how the older they get, things change in their relation to the characters and fan community. And although I'm pretty new to the fan base, it totally makes sense to me. So many discussions around these types of issues in fictional media, especially anime, end with, it's not real, they're just characters, get over it, it's not that deep. And at the same time, so many discussions about real-world issues are informed through what we see in the media. It happens all the time, and it's such a frustrating paradox to hear how much cultural and social understanding we take from what we consume to later discount any real complaints just because it's media. We can do better than that. If you're smart enough to understand a little bit of what the fuck is going on in Evangelion, you're smart enough to know something's up. But as we previously talked about, one of the reasons this shit gets put into so many things in the first place is because of the fan reception. I just hope we can all learn to empathize a little more. With sexual abuse survivors, with people who call out what makes them uncomfortable, with girls who grow up in a society that forces them into the male gaze, and with the fictional characters that are helping to teach us all this. If we want to make real change in our global culture around sexual abuse and predation, we have to make a concerted effort to really understand what's going on here, textually and subtextually, in our media and in our daily lives. And that can mean seeing an intention of a work that wasn't its outcome, positively or negatively. What we need is nuance, understanding, intersectionality, and empathy. I'm excited for a future where girls just get to be girls, and this pain isn't expected.
I guess we don't know any better, do we? Really? Do you think so? Yep. We're blissfully ignorant. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate you getting through it if you did. I know it's really intense subject matter, but I had a lot to say, and hopefully it all comes together the way I mean for it to. Despite being shorter than my first two videos, this took so long to put together, and I'm really proud of the outcome. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more of my content, make sure to like and subscribe to my channel so I can see you next time.